Hare Krishna. Om Gyana Chimarandasya. Gyananjana Shalakaya. Chakshun Militang Yena. Tazmai Sri Gurave Nama. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Prabhu Nichananda. Sri Adwaita Gradhar. Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. 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 Hare Hare. We're getting near the end of Narada Muni's allegory of ten components spoken to Daksha's sons, the Haryaspas. We ended the other night talking about time. And I think that that is how we'll begin tonight. I think we have a very interesting discussion scheduled for tonight. And of course, besides discussing Bhava, the world of repeated birth and death, we'll be discussing Bhava. Some nectarian drops from Bhakti Rasami to Sindhu, the ocean of the nectar of devotion. But first time, let's recall what Narada Muni told the boys about it. Kala Chakram Brahmitikshnam Sava Nish Karshayaj Jagat Swatantram Abhutas Yeha Kimasat Karma Beer Bavet. Narada Muni had spoken of a physical object made of sharp blades and thunderbolts. The Haryasvas understood this allegory as follows. Eternal time moves very sharply, as if made of razors and thunderbolts. Uninterrupted and fully independent, it drives the activities of the entire world. If one does not try to study the eternal element of time, what benefit can he derive from performing temporary material activities? An aspiring transcendentalist is always thinking about the role of time in his or her life. Not just to be punctual in terms of our daily responsibilities and logistical efforts, but the Bhakti Yogi is reflective about time, contemplative about time. What is my purpose in being within the clutches of time? And how do I get out of the clutches of time? Many of you may recall my explanation based on an instruction Narada Muni gives in the first canto. Tasyaiva heto prayate to kovi. One who is actually a kavi a learned person does not strive for anything that's available within the entire universe. Such a person does not strive for happiness, knowing, as Prahlad Maharaj reiterates in the seventh canto, that material happiness comes automatically according to your karma, just as distress does. So Narada Muni points out that time is like the courier service. Not simply a courier service that delivers packages, but a courier service that delivers happiness and distress. 
Kalena Sarvatra Gabira Ramhasa. That is Narada Muni's instruction in the first canto. Your happiness and distress will come to you automatically whether you strive for it or not. And you may know how I always point out this is so counterintuitive. We're so driven to grab happiness and beat back distress. It's all up to us. One life is all you get. <laughs> we even get bewildered just hearing that your happiness and distress comes to you automatically according to your karma. It's delivered by time. Time's the courier system. So as I always point out, time is not just movements on your watch or your clock. Time brings stuff to your doorstep. And as long as you're within the grip of time, that's what life will be like. So in the first scan of Narada Muni is already urged. Don't try for anything available within the material cosmos. Of course, bhakti has no bounds or confinement by anything material. Bhakti is a phenomenon of the spiritual world. Krishna's internal potency. As powerful as we may be, what can we do about time? So we try not to think about it if we're in material consciousness. Let's forget about time, especially when people take intoxication. They have a temporary, they think, respite from thinking about time. In fact, they relish just having a feeling of seeming timelessness. Total illusion. Illusion stacked upon illusion. This Kala Chakra that Narada Muni is speaking about to the Haryasvas has characteristics. It's a physical object in his allegory that he gives. A physical object made of sharp blades and thunderbolts. The, the Haryasvas understood, yes, time is very fearful. And it's always moving, this physical object made of sharp blades and thunderbolts. Similarly, time keeps driving, keeps driving. You can't stop it by any material methods. You remember the famous statement by the physicist who led the team in the USA that invented the nuclear bomb when they did their first test explosion in the desert before it was dropped upon two cities in Japan. The first explosion witnessed by this foremost scientist brought to mind a verse from Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says, Kalos me, time I am, destroyer of the worlds. We might point out that, Mr. Oppenheimer, uh, there's already enough destruction in this world. Time is mowing everyone down. We don't need to add to it. We can see today that no matter how strong a nation's military is, the viruses are on the march. That is a form of time taking its toll and we grieve for the suffering caused unnecessarily in this world because we don't know the process for getting out of the clutches of time. Time nails us, it gets us this way, that way, war, viruses, car accidents, cancer. This is all the work of time.
And Narimuni describes this allegorical object, physical object, with sharp razor blades and thunderbolts. It's sharp because it destroys in a very harsh way. So an intelligent person wants to know, is there a way to rise above time? You may recall in the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadeva Goswami says, Ayur Hadati Vai Pumsam, both by the rising and the setting of the sun, and I'm sure you've seen some beautiful sunrises and sunsets, but Shukadeva Goswami is pointing out that there's something else going on. By both the rising and setting of the sun, our life is being diminished, except for the one who utilizes his or her time in glorifying Krishna. Yes, the body of the Bhakti Yogi has its finish, but we're not the body. The spirit soul is eternal. And the Bhakti Yogi has realization of that. And therefore, he or she has realization of timelessness. We spoke the other day about how time ruins all our endeavors for full satisfaction. And that's why we get so jittery in this material world, because we just can't get our hands on substantial and lasting satisfaction. Everything is so dodgy and chancy and fleeting. So that leaves us to be full of anxiety, on edge, easily angered, or you just dive into intoxication or become a workaholic or a passionaholic, anything to escape the existential reality. So it is time that deteriorates our anything fresh except what is of the spiritual energy. And we'll be talking about that tonight when we discuss a bit from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. We'll be discussing the 53rd quality out of 64. The 53rd quality of Krishna known as Nitya Nutana. Ever fresh. To give you some appreciation of ignorance in dealing with time in relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I thought to present to you a section from a book by a celebrity scientist, the most renowned scientist since Einstein. He departed two years ago, Stephen Hawking. Uh, before I give you some choice extracts from what he says in relation to time and whether there is a supreme controller or not, uh, let me issue a caveat that uh, he's a lousy philosopher. <laughs> so even atheistic scientists who agree with his conclusion, there is no supreme they recognize that when it comes to philosophy and philosophical presentation, uh, this celebrity scientist is out of his field. And again, we don't want to present this most renowned scientist as 100% representative of every scientist. Sometimes devotees do that. Well, Stephen Hawking said, now just see. <laughs> Yes, he's got a, he had a big mouth in terms of what he said. He was famous as a propagator of 
the non-existence of a supreme cause of all causes. You'll hear about that. So because he had such a big mouth coming from such a renowned person, we sometimes mention him. But let's keep him in context, please. So listen to this. The role played by time at the beginning of the universe is, I believe, the final key to removing the need for a grand designer and revealing how the universe created itself. Talk about religion. <clears throat> Talk about faith. So we get rid of not simply Krishna as a supreme enjoyer, but we also get rid of Krishna as a supreme controller, maintainer, destroyer. And we invest all our hope, all our faith in matter. As he says here, the universe created itself. Now that is a huge leap of faith. You've definitely got to have some evangelical fervor to you. We'll go on here. The laws of nature dictate something quite extraordinary. They tell us, I'll move ahead of it. You can't get to a time before the Big Bang because there was no time before the Big Bang. We have finally found something that doesn't have a cause. <laughs> He's so happy. We finally found something that doesn't have a cause. No Sarvakarna Karnam. No Krishna, the supreme cause of all causes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Blessed be my atheism. <laughs> I've got so much religious feeling. I'm so beliefy. <laughs> we have finally found something that doesn't have a cause. Why? Because there was no time for a cause to exist in. Now, why is that? Because he says so. <laughs> According to his tiny brain, there was no time for a cause to exist in, and there can't be any cause outside of time. He's got it all figured out. He says, for me, this means that there is no possibility of a creator because there is no time for a creator to have existed in. Oh, really? <laughs> Srimad Bhagavatam Bhagavad Gita tell us that Krishna is not under the laws of nature. He exists within time. He exists outside of time. Time doesn't affect him, even though time is his energy. He continues. But with his ignorance, I must say very lucidly, very beautifully articulated, but unfortunately, it's nonsense talk. People want answers to the big questions, like why we are here. They don't expect the answers to be easy, and so they're prepared to struggle a bit. When people ask me if a God created the universe, I tell them that the question itself makes no sense. Mm. <laughs> Why does the question itself make no sense? Time did not exist before the Big Bang, so there is no time for God to make the universe in. Mm. So Stephen Hawking requires that God operate within time, otherwise. <laughs> but, he says, before the Big Bang, there was no time, so that cancels out the Supreme. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang, so there is no time for God to make the universe in. He goes on to say, it's like asking for directions to the edge of the earth. But the earth is a sphere that doesn't have an edge. 
So looking for it is a futile exercise. In other words, similarly, looking for a supreme cause of all causes is futile. There's no time before the Big Bang for Krishna to operate in. Just like living entities need oxygen to survive. Similarly, he says, if there's a God, he would need time to survive. And there was no time then before the Big Bang. So <laughs> it's easy to understand in his eyes. He goes on. There's one more paragraph. That's all I can take. Do I have faith? He asks. We are each free to believe what we want. And it's my viewpoint that the simplest explanation is that there is no God. No one created the universe and no one directs our fate. This leads me to a profound realization. There is probably no heaven an afterlife either. I think belief in an afterlife is just wishful thinking. There's no reliable evidence for it, and it flies in the face of everything we know in science. I think that when we die, we return to dust. And then he gives a little concession, a typically atheistic concession. But there's a sense in which we live on in our influence and in our genes that we pass on to our children. You remember the saying I often quote, live to become a memory. That's as best as it gets. Or as my father tried to impress upon me when I was 14 as to what the, as to the meaning of life. My dear son, Leave some tracks in the sand when you're gone. You've heard it before. <laughs> he wasn't like Narada Muni. <laughs> so I didn't get such instructions from him that like what Narada Muni gave to the Haryasvas. Mm. This world is suffering for a lack of scientific understanding of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The more people engage in material activities, the more dull they become, the more difficult it becomes for them to understand non-material knowledge. Yet that non-material knowledge is what will rectify their entire existential situation. So we're caught like in a catch-22, we're caught in a bind, they're suffering because of ignorance. And in that ignorance, they're not interested in what is Raja Vijja, the king of all knowledge. And due to that lack of interest, they accumulate more ignorance, which leads to more material activities. The cycle just goes on and on. Remember what Queen Kunti said? A vijja, kama, karma, bi. A vijja, step one, absorption in nescience, ignorance. Step two, kama, material desire, lust, greed. And then number three, karma, material activities. Mm, this trio makes the wheel of time spin, the kala chakra spin. And that Kala Chakra, that Wheel of Time, Narada Muni points out to the Hyaspas, is <clears throat> Swatantram, independent. Who can stop time? It doesn't care for your most brilliantly expressed nonsensical statements your most arduous, exhausting endeavors. Time doesn't care. It's independent of what you think as it inflicts upon you your due 
share of happiness and distress. Just to help us clearly understand, Prabhupada gives you one of his famous amplified <laughs> word for words. Swatantram, independent, not caring for the so-called scientists and philosophers. <laughs> of course, we appreciate scientists and philosophers who point persons in the right direction. But what you heard Mr. Hawking, the departed Mr. Hawking stay, state, uh, ignorance dramatically expressed. Not everyone will accept what he said, but because he's a celebrity scientist, he'll have a negative effect on some. Let's change gears now. We've discussed bhava, and how about some bhava from Bhakti Rasamri to Sindhu? We're going to discuss, as I said, Nitya Nutana. How Krishna is ever fresh. That's one of his qualities. Indeed, number 53 out of 64. Mm. Sadanu bhu yamano pi karot yananu bhutavat vishmayan maduri birya saprokto nichanu tanaha. Ever fresh. He who, although experienced, he who, although experienced all the time, creates a sense of wonder with his sweet qualities by appearing to be previously unrelished is called Nitya Nutana, or ever fresh. So you got that? <laughs> For his devotees, Krishna is experienced all the time. Still, he creates a sense of wonder with his sweet qualities in that he appears to the devotee who's experienced him all the time, he appears to the devotee to be previously unrelished. This is a new experience, this is like never before, although that devotee is always in the presence of Krishna. So this kind of person, the supreme person, is called Nitya Nutana or ever fresh, Rupa Goswami explains. So we have an example given by Rupa Goswami from the first canto, Bhagavatam, chapter 11, text 33. <clears throat> Let's pull that up. This is the chapter entitled Lord Krishna's Entrance into Dwarka. Remember? He had exited Hastinapur, Queen Kunti's prayers, Yudhisthira's pleading were part of his exit from Hastinapur. And then he entered into Dwarka, where the queens of Dwarka are. Although Lord Krishna was constantly by their sides, as well as exclusively alone with them, his feet appeared to them to be newer and newer. The goddess of fortune although by nature always restless and moving, could not quit the Lord's feet. So what woman can be detached from those feet, having once taken shelter of them? So you're hearing 
what is confirmed in the Brahma Samhita. Lakshmi Sahasra Satasambrahma Sevyamanam Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. Those goddesses of fortune discussed, those Lakshmis discussed in that verse by Lord Brahma, refer to Krishna's most intimate devotees in Vrindavan who expand into the queens of Dwarka. Still, for the queens of Dwarka and for the milkmaids of Vrindavan, although they're always, so to speak, in a lonely place with the Lord, the milkmaids in the forest of Vrindavan the queens in each in their own palace. Still, Krishna, although always with them, appears to them to be newer and newer. This is very important for contrasting our material experience with the spiritual experience. We discussed before about how everything material becomes hackneyed. I always point out, many of you have heard, take your favorite material activity, whatever it used to be, I hope it used to be, no matter what it is, you can't do it continuously, 24-7, without becoming disgusted with it. You can't even be around your favorite person 24-7 without getting a bit weary, materially speaking. You need to take a break. <laughs> but here, these devotees of Krishna, although always with him, even alone with him, they can't quit the Lord's lotus feet. Those feet appear to be newer and newer. The whole experience of being with Krishna is newer and newer. So the question is asked, what woman can be detached from those feet once she's taken shelter of them? Remember, a few weeks ago we explained about how material existence is like honey on a piece of toast and a fly enters the room. Ah, this is just what I want. Lands on the honey-covered toast and, you know, gets stuck. And the more the fly struggles, the more it's entangled, the more its wings and legs become covered, smeared with the honey. It's trapped. And then there's Krishna, whose beautiful form is like honey and the bee-like eyes of the gopis land on the honeyed form of the Supreme Lord and become stuck. <laughs> so you choose which you want to get stuck into. This verse describes how the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, is always restless and moving. Yet still, Lakshmi Devi couldn't quit the Lord's feet. That shows you how powerful the attractiveness of the Supreme Lord is. Of course, Lakshmi is with Lord Narayan in Vaikuntha. She's famous for not being able to be stable and tied down in her, that is, in her material expansion. in the form of 
fame, fortune, opulence in the material world. Those come and go so quickly. I like one explanation of fame and reputation given. Fame, when you get it, it's like receiving an umbrella in the hot sun. You hold that umbrella over your head. Ah, at last I have respect, acclaim, fame, I'm celebrated. So yes, the explanation goes, you do feel relief. Ah, I'm so well known. I'm so appreciated. But the effort to continually hold that umbrella is very taxing because the umbrella is very heavy. In other words, to maintain your status of fame and acclaim in this world is a hard task. It's a difficult task. It's hard work. And you can't take that fame and acclaim with you at the time of death. So this is the nature of Lakshmi Devi's material expansion in the material world in terms of fortune, fame, acclaim, opulence. But that same Lakshmi Devi in Vaikuntha never leaves Lord Narayan. As we go deeper into this verse, uh, we find, according to Vishwanath Chakwari Thakur, that these queens of Dwarka welcoming Krishna back to his capital city saw him with intense desire. So they first embraced him with their eyes. Eyes filled with spiritual desire. And then they brought him into their eyes and within themselves, they embraced him. And they didn't want others to understand what they were doing. This same, uh, mm, how do we say? All right, methodology is followed in even a more intimate and intense way by Krishna's most intimate associates in Vrindavan. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to make a point that Krishna's loving affairs are the unlimited perfection of what we struggle so much in the material world for. We struggle so pathetically. How can we deny the perfection of romance in the ultimate source when it's such a prominent feature of material existence? People's hearts are crying out, I want to be in love. I want to have a loving affair. Where is my partner? I want to be in a relationship. Well, the relationship I'm in now is not fulfilling. I thought it was a year ago, but he doesn't do this and she doesn't do that. And where is the love? My heart is still crying out. Krishna's love hankerings are perfect. He has, as Krishna's coverage Goswami points out in Chaitanya Charitamrita, the quality of Suraja Lakshmi. He's independent in fulfilling all his desires. He has unlimited desires and he is unlimitedly independent in fulfilling all of his unlimited desires. That is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
whatever you see in the material world is there perfectly in the ultimate source. That's why, as you know, the first verse of Bhagavatam says, Janmari Yasitaha, the Supreme Absolute Truth, is that from which everything emanates. So I always emphasize, everything means everything. So how can we deprive Krishna of his loving affairs? His qualities, his activities, his form, his names. What can be done? They're infinitely attractive. And you don't want him to have relationships with devotees? You say it's all mythological? But when it comes to your affairs, oh, it's so serious. I've got to read a book on relationships. Let's go to a marriage counselor. Or, uh, let's do something. We're such impersonalists and voidists, though, we'll deny Krishna of his capacity as a supreme enjoyer. We're envious. So I, I want to make a point. You're hearing about the Queens of Dwarka embracing the returning Lord Krishna in their heart by taking him through the eyes and they didn't want others to know what they were doing. And then we're going to hear how the situation is even more intense in Vrindavan. But before we get there, <clears throat> listen to this. These are these this is a list of love bewilderment gathered by a famous anthropologist in who studies romance. She's the one I got the statistic from that uh, the global average of the duration of material loving feelings, romantic feelings is 17 months. So she's assembled a list of the symptoms of the behavioral symptoms of someone in love. She has mm, some terminology here, some abbreviations, actually. L-O, remember that. L-O means the love object, the object of your love. And L-P means love possessed, the person who's possessed by love and wants to pour it into the L-O, the love object. Actually, this has a correlation. Those of you who have read Chaitanya Charitamrita, the fourth chapter of Adi Lila, know that Krishna is referred to as the Vishay, the object of love, and his dear most devotee is referred to as Ashray, the shelter of love, the one who is loving the object. Interesting. Shows you, indeed, how our material affairs are perverted reflections of the spiritual world. So let's hear some of the symptoms of the magic of being bewildered or bewitched by love. In quotes, love. Number one. Your love object, your L.O., becomes or assumes special meaning. The, the L.O., the love object, becomes unique, novel, and all important. Oh, Juliet is the sun. You are my everything. <laughs> Juliet is the moon. <laughs> So the anthropologist adds the point that humans have inability to feel romantic passion for more than one person at a time. I don't recommend you experiment to test whether this is true or not. Of course, you've heard about Krishna and Dwarka, 16,108 wives. 
each one with her own palace, each one with her own Krishna. <laughs> Everything about Krishna is unlimited. So as Srila Prabhupada would often point out, the question is not, why did Krishna have 16,108 wives? The question is, why only 16,108? If he's unlimited, he can have unlimited. <laughs> totally different way of looking at the situation. So number one, your love object assumes special meaning. Number two, focused attention. The love-possessed person, the LP, focuses almost all attention on the LO, the love object. Even becoming inattentive to work, other family members, friends, also, the love-possessed person focuses on all the events, the songs, the letters, the emails, the WhatsApp chat messages, everything associated with the love object. Seventy-three percent of men and eighty-five percent of women remember trivialities that love objects said or did. 83% of men and 90% of women replay these trivialities in their mind's eye as they contemplate the love object. An example is given from <clears throat> medieval literature from Old England. Someone named Lancelot. He finds the queen's comb lying on the road after her entourage passes by. And that comb he found lying on the road had several of her golden hairs tangled in it. He worshiped those hairs. 100,000 times he touched those hairs to his eyes, his mouth, his forehead, his cheeks. Yes, this is definitely focused attention. But you see the perfection of that in Krishna's affairs in Vrindavan. What else? Excessively glorifying the love object. Even the tiniest things are blown up and perceived as so glorious. If you push the love possessed person, hey, there must be some negative things about the love object. Uh, can you list them? the love-possessed person can actually list the negative attributes of the beloved. But they quickly dismiss them or they persuade themselves that, oh, these are just unique characteristics and they're actually charming in their own way. He or she has some faults, but they really don't bother me. And some even adore the loved object because of these faults. I love everything about him or her. So you flagrantly ignore reality. Psychologists call this the pink lens effect, rose colored glasses. That leads to the famous saying, Love is a story one makes up in one's mind about another person, even if one knows it isn't true. Or love is blind. A story one makes up in the mind. You know how Bhagavatam explains how material existence is lived in the mind. It's the nature of the conditioned soul to always be manufacturing something with the polluted intelligence. Remember the first part of Narada Muni's allegory to the Haryasvas? There's an unchaste spouse who dresses very alluringly and has a is married to a spouse who has to go through a lot of trouble because he or she is 
partnering with such an unchaste person. So that unchaste person, of course, is material intelligence, which has no capacity for properly directing the mind. So therefore, material existence is lived in the mind, is basically <laughs> scant intelligence applied. So not only do you make up a story in your mind about so-called love, but you make up uh, the whole story of material existence in our mind. You can understand now why twice in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Mamana Bhavabhadva, always think of me, become my devotee. The whole process of bhakti is to get us to start thinking about Krishna again. What gives Krishna pleasure? How can I serve Krishna better? Number four, intrusive thinking, obsessive meditation on the love object. 85% of the waking hours, the love possessed person is thinking of the love object. You even forget the passing of time. Everything you think ends with thoughts of the beloved. And then there's that emotional fire. This anthropologist reports 80% of men and 79%, oh, it's quite close, of women experience that when I feel the love object, when I feel the love object is thinking of me, I feel lighter than air. A torrent of intense emotions pours through the mind. You make me crazy. You take away my breath. You set my soul on fire. My whole heart, my whole life is aflame. This is material Baba. My sister was asking me yesterday about the definition of this word Baba. She found it in the first canon. And I explained that it refers to any emotional state. But of course, in the context of the Queens of Dwarka and Krishna's most intimate devotees in Vrindavan, Baba is referring to love of Krishna with all its intensities. But there's also material Baba experienced in bhava, experienced in the world of repeated birth and death. So any kind of emotional absorption is a bhava. Just like at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the characteristics of the warrior and administrative class. And he uses the term Ishwar Bhava, they have that Bhava or emotional absorption in being the controller. Chatram Karma Swabhava. Their activities are characterized by heroism, being resourceful, never yudhe chapyapalayanam, never turning their back in battle. And they have a ruling tendency to want to control. Of course, in the ideal Vedic system, the Brahmanas are on top. The spiritual intellectuals live simply and give the best advice. And that tempers the ruling, that Ishwar Bhava, that ruling absorption of the Chakriyas the Vedic martial and administrative class. So, Baba certainly can refer to as Lord Rishabdev does in the fifth canto, Matuni Bhava, that absorbed state that's created when man and woman project on each other and reciprocate. 
So it's interesting how all these characteristics, symptoms of the magic of being bewildered, <laughs> are there in perfection in Krishna Leela. We're just experiencing a perverted reflection. Sometimes critics say that, oh, you're just imagining that Krishna is like this based on your human experience. Anthropomorphic. Now the reverse, they've got it upside down. Because of Krishna's experience, we tiny parts and parcels have a tiny bit of the same characteristics, generally speaking. So... We set up shop in the material world and we try to pursue what Krishna has perfectly and unlimitedly. I'll read a couple of more. Intense energy. When I think of the love object, I feel like jumping in the sky. My heart races. I feel a surge of energy when with the love object. Some of you may have felt like this. It's considered practically the perfection of life. Although it, in the material world, it's so transitory. And then mood swings. The feelings soar and dive. If the love object gives attention, calls, writes, affectionate emails or blissful meeting, WhatsApp, Facebook, something, then the whole world glows. Otherwise, when you perceive indifference, no response to messages, calls, anything that sends a negative signal and therefore the love-possessed person plunges into despair. You see all this going on in Brudge Leela, <laughs> but there's not one trace of material contamination. Everything's happening for Krishna's pleasure. <laughs> Even when Krishna's most intimate associates chastise him or say they're through with him, <laughs> this is all going on to create Juice, rasa, spice. So when the love-possessed person plunges into despair, he or she becomes deflated, depressed, mopes around, until you can revive your trampled heart and renew the chase. And then when the love is returned again. There's exhilaration. But if the love is ignored, there's anxiety, despair, even rage. Sounds all too familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> the material poets and singers like to say, love makes the world go round. Well, this is all what they're referring to without knowing that they'll never be happy on this merry-go-round, this carousel. It goes round and around through all these different symptoms of material bhava and ends up in the same place as always. The thrill fades away sooner or later because of time. Let's look at, let's go beyond Vaikuntha to the topmost part of the spiritual world. Krishna's Boma Lila, his man, that manifestation of his pastimes when he appears on earth, as well as his original affairs in Goloka Vrindavan. Another gopi looked with unblinking eyes upon his lotus face. 
but even after deeply relishing its sweetness, she did not feel satiated, just as mystic saints are never satiated when meditating upon the Lord's feet. So see, this satiation is very important. Never satiated means they're satisfied, but they want more. Never like, I've seen this before. I've been in this situation before. The same Krishna. Nothing new. They never feel that way. One gopi took the Lord through the aperture of her eyes and placed him within her heart. Then, with her eyes closed and her bodily hair standing on end, she continuously embraced him within. Thus immersed in transcendental ecstasy, she resembled a yogi meditating upon the Lord. Of course, this is the perfection of bhakti. Mm. This is nothing to do with material exchanges, material bodies, material emotions. <clears throat> so the Acharyas explain that this particular intimate associate of Krishna understood, oh, this Krishna, he can come and go. Even if he comes, he'll go away. So better I take him into my heart. You remember that's what the Queens of Dwarka did? But here it's much more intense. Because the Queens of Dwarka are affected by Aishvarya, Krishna's opulence. Whereas in Vrindavan there's just the sweetness. So she took Krishna through her eye holes and closed then she closed her eyes so Krishna couldn't escape, as she thought. And then her body erupted in ecstatic symptoms. And she stood just in a pose of embracing Krishna to her, arm, to her chest with her arms. She didn't have to worry about being shy because no outsiders were observing her. Now, these particular gopis mentioned in this section of Bhagavatam are understood to be the kind of rebellious ones, known as Vama. They play hard to get for Krishna's pleasure. And then there are the Dakshinya, the un- how do you say the cooperative ones, the peaceful ones, who always think, I belong to Krishna. Whereas the uncooperative ones always think, Krishna is mine. <laughs> so in this way, the Acharyas explain that Baba has two types. One type is filled with this dakshina sentiment, dependence on the lover, filled with the thoughts that I belong to Krishna. The other is vamya sentiments, making the lover dependent on oneself, and filled with thoughts of Krishna is mine. Of the two chief bhavas that we just mentioned, the one with the sentiments that Krishna is mine is superior because there is a superior flow of deep prema. And 
and from the possessiveness of Krishna, Krishna's mind, arises this vamya, or also defined as crookedness. The movement of prem is crooked like that of a snake. Krishna comes under the control of that kind of, especially of that kind of bhava, bhamya bhava. So, of course, we're speaking about the most confidential activities of Krishna. We do that with great care and respect. <clears throat> we're discussing Nityanuttana, how Krishna is ever fresh. We've given examples from the queens of Dwarka, Krishna's most intimate consorts in Vrindavan. We've discussed Lakshmi Devi and Vaikuntha and her reflected aspect in the material world. In her original features, Jiva Goswami explains, she's steady in being attached to Krishna's feet, excuse me, Lord Narayan's feet. But her reflection in the material world, Chanchala, restless, can't stay tied down. And therefore, in material life, you can't hold on to your good fortune, your fame. Even if it's with you until death, you can't take it with you. People may still remember you for a few hundred years, even a thousand years, but where are you? You're separated from your good fame and fortune. Now Rupa Goswami gives an example from his text, Lalita Madhava. It's an interesting example about how Krishna is ever fresh. We're really getting into this tonight. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to have time for questions tonight. I have to do this last explanation given by Rupa Goswami from Lalita Madhava about how Krishna is ever fresh. This one's kind of mystical sounding. You, you have to pay attention a bit more. This is a statement by Vrindavan Esri, the queen of Vrindavan, Shimati Radharani. She's asking a friend One of her girlfriends. Oh, beautiful faced friend, who is this unique craftsman, Vishvakarma, standing in front of us? He is breaking the stones of chastity in all the young girls from noble families. With the ends of the long, sharp, chisel-like corners of his eyes. And simultaneously, he's constructing a cow pen using millions of sapphires. Who is this unique craftsman, Vishvakarma? So, Vishvakarma is the construction engineer, so to speak, for the demigods and the heavenly planets. Krishna's most intimate devotee is saying there's such a unique craftsman like Vishvakarma standing right in front of us. And what is he doing? He's doing two things at once by his construction efforts, so to speak. He's breaking the stones of chastity in all the young girls from noble families because of the long, sharp, chisel-like corners of his eyes. He's looking at us, breaking the stones of our chastity. 
And simultaneously, he's constructing a cow pen using millions of sapphires. So first of all, understand that this is showing how Krishna's dearest devotee experiences Krishna in increasingly unique ways. <laughs> Nichanutsna, ever fresh. Like she never saw him before. And each time she sees him, it's unique, different. So how can she say, he looks like he's simultaneously constructing a cow pen using millions of sapphires. She's seeing the rays emanating. This is Jiva Goswami's explanation. She sees the rays emanating from Krishna's body as comparable to sapphires. So Krishna is obviously near some cow pen and Srimati Radharani is seeing that the cow pen is made of millions of sapphires because of all the rays from Krishna's body, which are comparable to sapphires. Very unique vision. But, Jiva Goswami explains what further what she's thinking. This is not an ordinary Vishva karma. This is not an ordinary construction engineer of the demigods world. Why? Because while this person, why this Krishna is doing the difficult work of constructing a cow pen, quote, out of sapphires, unquote, simultaneously he's breaking the stones of the gopis dharma. He's attracting them all to him. All the young girls he's attracting to him. So he's performing two difficult tasks at once. Crushing the stones of the gopis' dharma of chastity and with the other stones, his sapphire-like bodily rays, he's constructing a cow pen for the cows. Very beautiful, strikingly unique and distinctive way of seeing Krishna's ever-freshness. So that's it for tonight for Bhava. Let's see if we can squeeze in mm, one or two questions. We'll try to finish a couple of them from the previous night. Bhagopal Das asks, would you please be kind and explain how Krishna, the Supreme Controller, retains his Ishwar status, his controller status, while it seems he is under the control of all the love of his devotees in Braj. Krishna voluntarily comes under their control. Under the control of, not exactly of them, but of their love by his own arrangement. Sometimes you see, even in this world, <laughs> maybe our Bhagopal himself has said to his wonderful wife, Ananda Chandra, yes, my dear, whatever you want. <laughs> Under the influence. So Krishna is a supreme enjoyer. Do you think he just wants to control all the time or create, maintain, and destroy? No. As a supreme enjoyer, he knows what is the best enjoyment. To come under the control of the pure love of his pure devotees. He delights in that. It's not a contradiction. It's part of his completeness. Krishna is so complete that in his repertoire is not simply 
being the order giver, but also he comes under the influence of his pure devotee's love voluntarily. Therefore, he runs in fear when Mother Yashoda chases him with a stick in her hand. Sometimes he begs his most intimate consorts, especially the rebellious ones, the uncooperative ones, the Vamya type. He begs, oh, please have mercy on me. <laughs> this is all part of completeness. Krishna's full of everything. But everything about him is perfect and complete. Another devotee, Nalini Kant Das asks, do coronaviruses have souls? Okay. <laughs> That's a unique question. We're always thinking of killing them. Although they are behaving as a result of human activities. Yes, anything that's animate, anything that's living has a spirit soul there. But if a creature is acting in the role of an aggressor, you have a right to defend yourself. If a mosquito actually attacks you, it's acting in the role of aggressor and you have the right to whack the mosquito. So certainly, although human beings have brought about so many infectious diseases upon them by inappropriate lifestyles and also by their karma, of course, karma means inappropriate lifestyle. Inappropriate lifestyle means karma. Still, human beings should defend themselves against viruses. But they stop one virus, another type will come. Until we understand what is the real disease, as I've explained in previous classes, the real virus, the real disease is material existence. That's why Narada Muni is speaking the way he does to the Haryasvas. Stop material existence. Kimasat karma beer bavet. What's the use in just jumping like monkeys through the hoops of material existence? What's the use? Hmm. All right, Manobi Ram Das. From what I understand, one result of successfully performing the process of Bhakti Yoga is that we can go back to Godhead at the end of this lifetime. Since there are many living entities who will be left suffering in material existence, is it possible to aspire and to also actually remain for the purpose of helping them achieve their own salvation? Yes, it's possible to aspire that, as Prahlad Maharaj demonstrates. Prayena Deva Munayo, Sovi Muktakama. There are many great yogis, sages, who stay in a solitary place, aloof from the general populace, wanting to protect themselves. But I want to be in the biggest cities and towns where I can help the people. I don't want to go back to Godhead without them. That is the aspiration of the greatest devotees. We cannot criticize anyone who feels the genuine misery of material existence and wants to go back to Godhead. There are different levels of devotion, of bhakti. Pure bhakti means I'll go wherever Krishna wants to send me for his service. I just want the opportunity to 
engage in Krishna service, hear his glories, and associate with devotees. That's the pure devotional standard. As demonstrated by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, Mama Janmani Janmani Isure Babadad Bhakti Rahoi Tuki Twai. I don't mind birth after birth as long as I have devotional service to Krishna. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in one of his songs, says, Kita Jan Mahal. I don't mind taking birth as an insect as long as it's in the house of a devotee. If I'm a creature in the house of a devotee, and it's prasad time, I'll get some remnants. This is the standard of pure devotion. At the same time, we're not going to criticize anyone who wants to go back to Godhead in the sense of transferring to another destination. The real back to Godhead is in the consciousness of pure devotion. Whatever Krishna wants, however Krishna wants it. So there are different levels of love. So yes, one of the symptoms of the magic of being bewildered or bewitched by love of Krishna is what Lord Chaitanya talks about in the Shikshastaka. You can make me brokenhearted by not being present before me, but you're still my worshipful Lord unconditionally. This is the level that we want to progress to. You can't criticize someone from starting at the first year of school going on to the 11th or 12th or 13th year of school, doing their undergraduate studies and graduate studies and postgraduate. Every journey begins with a single step, but we should know what is the real standard of pure bhakti. All right. It's been wonderful for me sharing all these nectar drops with you. So I thank you all for your kind attention, for giving me an opportunity to speak about Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs>